Hello everyone, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers and esteemed attendees, organizers of the KPMG Summit. It is an absolute pleasure to be here today and to be sharing the stage with such a list of fantastic speakers. On a personal note, it's also an incredible honor for me to be keynoting at the KPMG Annual uh, Summit for the third year in a row. So I hope a lot of you are not tired of listening to me speaking so many times already. Uh, my name is Abdullah Kablan. I'm a tech entrepreneur, founder of a number of companies specializing mainly but not exclusively in AI, machine learning and their application in fintech. And we're now branching into gaming as well through Wiser and Wiser Plus as we'll take you through this presentation. I'm also an academic, lecturing and researching topics such as deep learning, algorithmic trading and principles of blockchain. And for the past year, I've had the honor of advising the government of Malta on setting up the regulatory framework to regulate technology arrangements and services, starting with DLT, out of which blockchain is an architecture, and with a vision from day one to move into artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. In fact, recently after we finalized the setting up of the regulatory framework and the announcement of the laws for blockchain, the government has announced an AI task force to set up the strategy for Malta to move into artificial intelligence. However, when it comes to artificial intelligence, unlike DLT, it is a little bit of a different beast. In fact, at the task force of artificial intelligence, we have around 11 or 12 intellectuals, and if you ask them what is the definition of artificial intelligence, you will not get the same answer from actually two of them. Because like intelligence itself, which is a very abstract term, artificial intelligence is even more abstract. My favorite definition of intelligence in general is the 18th century definition by the philosopher Jean Piaget, who said, intelligence is knowing what to do when neither innateness or learning has prepared you for such a situation. And we have different types of intelligence. We have intellectual intelligence, solving complex mathematical problems or playing chess. We have social intelligence, being able to deal with people publicly. We have emotional intelligence, being cognizant about the emotional state of people that we are interacting with. However, even though we experience these different types of intelligence as a whole, as people, even though some people are better at some than the other, when it comes to artificial intelligence, it doesn't mean that we can actually develop them in the same way. We have different types of intelligence when it comes to development that we can translate into artificial intelligence. And as my friend JJ has articulated, there is a lot that can be done when it comes to data acquisition, filtration, processing, and making sense out of large data sets, performing insight analysis and pattern recognition on large data sets, but still, we are more often than not looking at specified or specific problems. We have always looked at intelligence from a narrow perspective, trying to beat the human world champion at chess or at Go. Whilst if we actually try to create an artificial intelligence that would make a cup of tea in a kitchen that's never seen before, it is still very difficult for the AI to crack that problem. So in a time where we've had this arms race to build the next Einstein, what we should have really looked at is building the next Aristotle, an entity or an engine or a machine that can be interdisciplinary enough to understand different facets of life and different disciplines. Which is why myself and a team of other academics and nerds are actually looking into developing this concept of artificial wisdom to move a little bit more towards friendly AI. And when it comes to artificial wisdom, it actually takes us into trying to define something else other than intelligence, which is wisdom itself. But if we look at the data development life cycle, it's quite simple. It's, it's, it's five steps. You start with data, you develop, you process data, it becomes information. Information accumulates into knowledge, and knowledge with time and processing evolves into understanding of the problem domain. And understanding with experience coupled with very good processing, it evolves into wisdom. Most artificial intelligence systems out there are, sticks, are still stuck into being just knowledge bases and they haven't evolved into wiser systems yet. And the difference is quite clear. Knowledge is the difference between true and false. 
wisdom is knowing the difference between right and wrong, and it's very difficult for AI to actually capture that. Even more so, trying to move a bit into making AI as our friend. The problem with artificial intelligence, even though it's existed for quite some time, as my colleague Daniel will explain, so many years, decades, we've always looked at AI from a master-slave standpoint. I'm the human, you're the AI, you're my virtual assistant, and you'll only assist me. It's because we've never bonded with a machine or AI, or we have not comprehended the concept of bonding with a machine, the same way, bond, way we bond with, with other creatures. If you think of the concept of friendship, what is a friend? A friend is someone who um, triggers a chemical reaction in my brain and an emotional response. I can have a human best friend, someone that I can relate to, I can tell them my deepest, darkest secrets, it's my human best friend. Or I can have my dog as my best friend. It will see me coming back home after work, it, you know, it will wag its tail, it will be very happy, it will lick my face, and I will still get the same emotional response and chemical reaction in, in my brain, because I feel that this is genuinely my friend or, or my best friend. However, you deal with them differently. You can't you know, go to your dog and tell them about you know, your, your, your crush or someone that you really fancy. You can't go to your human best friend and tell them to fetch a ball after throwing it, because they'll get really pissed off at you. So even though we are treating them as, as best friends, they are different. And the problem with, with AI is that we've not elevated it yet to that, to that friendly model. And one of the main reasons is that we have not yet visualized AI, and visualization is incredibly important. If you think about some of the best AIs out there, your series, your Cortanas, your Alexas, your Watson, you cannot see them, who they are, and we cannot visualize them. And humans can relate more to something that they can visualize. In fact, if some of you remember Tamagotchis, those little devices where you can have a little pet and you can feed it and bathe it and feed it and bathe it, people were more emotionally attached to these little devices and Tamagotchis than they are, are actually attached to, to some of these very intelligent uh, systems that are out there. And one main reason is that we have not visualized them, which is why at Wiser we're working quite heavily in visualizing who is Wiser and who is this character that we're building. So even though we're looking at it from an emotional standpoint, we're also looking at helping the users bond with our artificial intelligence through visualization, which is incredibly important. But AI is also a threat. I mean, a lot of people have exhausted the, the topic of whether AI will be our biggest existential threat. And I personally believe that AI is an existential threat. When we hit singularity, when we have machines that are equally smart as, as humans, we will actually be in trouble because as humans we are irrational, we are predictably irrational. It doesn't take genius to see how flawed we are. Our history is replete with instances wh where we actually did self-destruct ourselves. So we need to look into solutions to help us even safeguard against the threat of AI itself. And lots of these solutions that are being explored are actually being provided by none other than the buzzword of the year, blockchain. And if you think about it, if we start deploying artificial intelligence into massive networks, that will also help in safeguarding against the threat of any AI going rogue, because by definition, in blockchain, you actually need to achieve consensus in order for you to execute certain uh, behavior or to exhibit certain behavior within, within a network. So the consensus mechanism of blockchain is actually being looked at as a safeguard against the threat of artificial intelligence. But well, it's not only that, even making intelligence machine better, a decentralized system would help us quite a lot. If you look at most AI systems that are learning out there, they're using very fancy, strong data acquisition, filtration, processing mechanisms. But if those mechanisms become decentralized, and if processing is happening on a much larger network, it's going to be quite interesting. It's a very hot topic. The only problem is that the current architectures we have when it comes to DLT and blockchain are quite slow to allow for that. But it looks quite promising. So I personally believe that we need to l move and look a little bit more seriously into the future where there's going to be a lot of human and machine interaction. We need to make sure that we ensure benevolence in the relationship between both by having the developers assuming their responsibility and making sure that the systems they are building, they're responsible enough for them not to pose any threat to us as humans. And to also at the same time make sure we're building quite good, exciting, and cool products that will use this fantastic technology to make 
our services much better, much more efficient, much faster, and to help the consumers get a much better experience, which is what we are doing at Wiser, and which is what I'm going to leave the honor of describing to my co-founder at Wiser, and also very dear friend, uh, Daniel Gregg, to take you through how we are disrupting the space using artificial intelligence, and I leave it to Daniel. Thank you so much. <laughs> So thank you for the introduction, Abdullah. So I'm Daniel Grek, um, and I'm a co-founder in Wiser. And I've spent a lot of my time over the past five, six years um, developing applications that make use of artificial intelligence in some form or another. So AI has been around for quite a while. Um, and it's actually probably the 1950s when people actually started to look into how we can build systems that exhibit some form of intelligence in some way or another. And initially it started as a kind of hobbyist research field. So people would build algorithms that learn how to play games. Um, people would build algorithms that can beat people at certain games. And uh, th this field was constantly evolving. There was a time where there was a class of problems that we thought we would never get uh, algorithms to solve. And in fact, AI went a bit rogue for 10, 15 years throughout its history. Recently, as I'm sure you know, there's, there's been quite a huge emergence of the term AI. So nowadays, we're using AI to solve problems that in the like 20, 30 years ago, we thought that we couldn't solve using AI. And a lot of this uh, advancement and hype being made is due to the fact that deep learning has come along. Now, deep learning really has been a game changer in both the academic and also the, the practical uses of AI. So AI researchers like to, like to get into competitions, um, and everybody submits their kind of algorithm, and uh, they get ranked at the end of it according to how well it performed. And with the emergence of deep learning in 2015, um, literally all the records of practically every competition, especially in image recognition and computer vision, was literally trumped using deep learning techniques. This obviously brought on the venture capitalists, the investors, and basically, as you can see, investment in AI sprung exponentially as soon as people started to see practical uses of, of this technology. And today, we actually have an AI ecosystem that is thriving. So although it's easy to get the impression that AI is something which is yet to come of the future, there are millions of companies out there, maybe not millions, but hundreds or thousands of companies out there um, who are already who use AI as part of their core model. And this is spanning across multiple industries. So even just hearing a couple of talks today, so we're, there are people using AI for customer service, there are people using AI for marketing. Um, it's used quite, as well, quite a lot as well in software development itself. And AI is, we're, we're seeing companies who are basically getting old business models that were successful and just adding AI to it. Having said that, adoption is still in early days. So more than half of the companies out there do not yet have any form of AI in their, in their solution or in their services. And quite a lot of companies out there are still in the pilot stage. So they're still trying to explore exactly what can be achieved and what can't be achieved using AI. And the reason that adoption is a bit slow is quite obvious. So AI isn't that easy to implement. Um, so when you, if I'm the CEO of a company and next day I decide that I'm going to start solving a problem using AI, it's really not that simple. So you need to have the right people in place, you need to have the right pipelines in place, you need to right, have the right infrastructure, and you need to know how to tackle an AI problem um, uh, mathematically. So the first concept in AI is to um, describe your problem in a mathematical form format. Uh, in the gaming industry, AI is, uh, I think, still in that early adoption stage. So there are a lot of people talking about AI, and probably a lot of people using service providers that use AI somehow internally. Um, but the kind of internet moment for AI in gaming, I think, is yet to come. And the way I see this developing is that uh, online gambling companies collect a lot, a lot of actionable data about their user. So about their users. So pretty much any action that is performed on an online platform is obviously logged and stored somehow. And if this, if this data is going to be kind of the fuel of organizations which will by default become more and more data driven, then AI is the car that is going to get us from point A to point B. Now, 
I'd like to maybe explain a bit at a very high level what goes into tackling a problem and solving it using AI. So the first thing that I do in trying to solve a problem is trying to formulate it mathematically. So we need to formulate it in terms of a prediction, a variable that we want to predict, and based on other variables that explain something about our outcome variable. And that process leads to feature engineering, which means we basically need to look at any data that we think is relevant to the problem that we're trying to solve. And this is usually in different formats on different servers, and it's quite a, quite a tough process. Um, and from that kind of data, we need to generate features that will help us solve this problem. Following that, we need to find the best model that maps our features to what we want to predict. And again, over there, it's a very subjective thing to do, so there are a lot of different models that you can try out. And if you get 10 data scientists to solve the same problem, I can guarantee you that no two of them will solve them the same. So today, I'm going to present some modern AI techniques which came about quite recently, so maybe two or three years ago, um, and which actu are actually part of the field of deep learning, which are, which are ready to be used today. So these are techniques that have come about quite recently, and which especially gaming companies can start using to make more of their data. So the first technique is deep feature synthesis. So deep feature synthesis um, aims to tackle the problem of feature engineering. So if you need to hire three people um, to look at your data and try to find patterns between data and uh, try to model patterns between an outcome that you want to predict and all of this data. Um, obviously, it takes a lot of time to get to a solution that you can put in production. Deep feature synthesis aims to automate part of this process or possibly all of this process. So what this is about is it's about uh, starting from probably the lowest level of data in your database. So if you go to any gaming operator out there, one thing which you'll find in the database is definitely an events table or a transactions table, basically describing what users are doing on, on your platform. Through deep feature synthesis, we can automate the application of various mathematical operations um, to find out features which actually are actually meaningful to the problem that we're trying to solve. And this is done in a fully automated way. So this is an example of uh, an experiment that we actually ran on Wiser. So using these, these transactions um, that we had, um, we ran this algorithm and tried to identify the features which are most important in this case to predict whether a customer will churn or not. And just having a look at which features were identified as the most important ones, um, we, can also, we can already get a feel um, as to how powerful this mechanism is. So the most important feature was the total number of transactions in the previous month. The second one was the average time between these transactions. So these are all features which, if somebody told you that a data scientist come, came, up, came up with them, um, I'm sure you would, they, they look believable. Once we identify these features, we then try out different types of models. And uh, obviously, we assess each model at how good it is at actually solving the problem. Based on that, once we reach a certain threshold, which we are happy enough to deploy, um, this model can go in production and start predicting whether your customers will churn or not. Um, as I said, we're using these, these sorts of techniques to predict things like customer lifetime value, um, fraud detection, probability of churn, and, uh, and spotting addiction, which is something which has also been tackled quite a lot today. The second technique that I'd like to um, outline is deep reinforcement learning. So I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of the, the super AI which uh, beat the champion of Go in the World Championship. Um, and that algorithm was actually trained using this technique. So reinforcement learning um, basically works by letting an algorithm experiment um, with, by performing different actions in an environment telling that algorithm how to assess itself, so it, it needs to realize whether the, whether the outcome is positive or negative, and letting it run for days, weeks, and months. We're using this technology to provide further personalization to, uh, to specifically to gaming operations in this case. So if you think about the way campaigns are managed and bonuses are the people who decide which bonuses go out to who, um, and how our platforms are personalized, um, so this is a very data-driven field. We have a lot of data from all the campaigns that we've run in the past. However, um, sometimes we tend to rely a little bit too much on intuition. So I have a feeling that this will work, this might work. Using, using the reinforcement learning, we can actually get an algorithm to try out a couple of different strategies 
um, on a sample size of users, so maybe a few of your most loyal users, um, and get the algorithm to figure out itself which campaign, which bonus, which game suits which player best. Last but not least, um, it's already been touched upon in the previous talk, so recently we've built models which are capable of understanding natural language um, up to a point which we're not, we are not capable of building these sort of models maybe five, six years ago. And this again is thanks to deep learning. So language is something that comes very natural to us humans. Um, it's kind of just intuitive to us. But when getting uh, an algorithm or a computer to actually understand language um, was, is, was something that we didn't think we could do effectively until quite recently. The advancement of uh, deep learning um, gave us something called word vectors. And word vectors are a representation of language in the terms of numeric uh, matrices and vectors in such a way that the relationships, uh, the semantic relationships between words actually holds in numeric format. So, for example, in this numeric space, the word king and masculinity would be close together. The distance between them would be short because they have a similar meaning. On the other hand, king and femininity would be far away in this vector space because they mean they, they're not um, very linked. Using this technique, so if once we, we have a good way of actually representing words, sentences, and semantics, um, we can then use these representations to teach neural networks how to actually classify between different types of messages and different types of languages. And the way that this is done is that we build layer by layer of networks, which each extract something that tells us something about a feature that we want to identify. So using these models, we can identify intents behind conversations, um, we can identify sentiment behind conversations, and we can really build systems that are based on semantics um, from language. And this is, again, something which uh, was not easily doable just a couple of years back. So obviously, this technology can be used for customer onboarding, customer service, and pretty much anywhere where you need to interact with your customers in an automated way. So thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, if you're interested in getting to know more about these techniques and uh, maybe getting some more information about our new platform, which contains features that utilize these techniques um, and pre-trained models specifically for the gaming sector, um, please get in touch with me or Abdallah um, either today or we'll also have a stand at Sigma. So feel free to chat. Thank you very much.